my name is Matthew Chatron. I am a, an astronomer uh, who works for Lick Observatory, and uh, my home base is the University of California, Santa Cruz. And um, I have a PhD in astrophysics, and uh, I have some telescope time tonight that I'm sharing with, uh, with you. And so what you're going to be seeing is not, well, hopefully seeing, is not uh, simulations. It's not, um, it's not made up. It's the real deal. We will be observing if we get to open the dome, if the weather is good enough. So things may not go as planned. Uh, the weather may be bad. We may have some instruments that misbehave. Um, we already had a computer disk die earlier uh, that was being replaced. So, um, so things don't always go as planned, but this is a night where you get to see how science is done and uh, that it is uh, chaotic and you have to think on your feet. And, uh, and I want to introduce my two students, Evan and Ivan. So uh, why don't you each, Evan, why don't you say something about yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Evan Carrasco. So I go to UC Santa Cruz as where Matthew works. Um, I'm currently an undergraduate studying for a BS in astrophysics. Um, I work with Matthew on a few different projects uh, as an astrochemist. Um, yeah. Okay, and Ivan? All right. Um, hi, everyone. My name is, oops, sorry. My name is Ivan. I'm a fourth year undergrad at uh, UC Santa Cruz. And yeah, right now I've just been helping Matthew with the uh, Carbon Star project that I think we're presenting a bit today, right? That's right. Yeah. We're going to be doing some observing for that project. And Ivan will be presenting the results of what we're collecting hopefully tonight and over the last a uh, couple of months. Uh, he'll be presenting that in a conference in New Orleans uh, in January. So uh, this is uh, somewhat informal. So, um, you know, we, we have a little bit planned scheduled, but things don't always go as planned. So, and if you have questions, you can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand and Evan and Ivan will help keep an eye on those as I keep an eye on the um, instrument. So I'm going to share a little bit of the screen uh, so you can sort of know what I'm looking at. So these are my screens that I am paying attention to. And um, I have uh, control over an instrument. And um, I can see what the telescope is doing. And, um, and I can watch the weather up here in this corner. And right now the humidity is at 93.7, which is a uh, very high humidity, which means dew could possibly form onto the telescope and the mirror. And so that's a bad thing for a telescope. And so we may have to, uh, may not be able to open. And there is a um, technician on site uh, who is an expert in the operation of the telescope and weather, and uh, they'll let me know whether we can open or not. And so that that screen is behind me. So if you see me turning around to talk to somebody, um, it's another Zoom uh, call. And I'm operating the telescope remotely from my office in my house in Bonnie Doon, uh, just above Santa Cruz. So, uh, any questions before we get started? I was going to have a, a short presentation about the project we're doing tonight. Uh, but if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them kind of now. So I should stop sharing. I can actually see. Okay, I'll take silence as no. So, um, we'll dive in. So, uh, Evan, would you share the Yes, I can do that. All right, can you see my screen? Great. So uh, what we're going to be observing tonight are stars. And uh, so um, this is a fairly 
fundamental kind of work in astronomy. It's classification of stars. And um, so I'm kind of taking us back to what it means to classify stars. And so I was hoping that maybe you'd be willing to look at this image and tell me what kinds of things you see in this image that be something you can use to classify a star. So what properties uh, of the stars do you see in this? So you can either uh, raise your hand or type it into the chat or... Um, size, yep, that works. So some of them look bigger than others. Right. There's a there's some color differences. Uh, there's a red one in the middle. Uh, anything else? But you got the basics. Brightness. That's right. Size. Size is sort of brightness in this. So uh, the brighter the star, the bigger that it looks on this image. So the very faintest ones uh, also happen to have a uh, small size on this image. So that's a correlation. That's something that scientists look for are things that are related to each other. So brightness and size are related. All right, so let's move on to the next image. So um, where things are in that image is also something. So I'm gonna remind you a little bit about the earth that uh, every point on the earth it has a coordinate, right? A GPS coordinate, uh, longitude and latitude. It also has an altitude. So um, I'm up in Bonnie Dune, and so I am like at 2,500 feet above sea level, uh, while the campus is only at like 500 feet. So um, longitude and latitude and altitude are ways of describing something on the surface of the Earth. But how do we describe things for stars? So can you go to the next slide? Mm -hmm. So uh, in the same way that we have this longitude and latitude, um, uh, things are at the equator or they're at the pole. And as the earth rotates, um, the stars above seem to move. So it's a little more complicated than just saying where things are. So if you go to the next slide, so this is the way things seem to move over time. So if you were looking up and you took a, a camera and took a long exposure, you'd see that things rotate around roughly the North Star. And uh, the longer you expose, the longer those lines seem to move. And so think nothing is fixed. Even that star that we call the North Star up there uh, is not really fixed. It's right exactly at the North Star. It's uh, at the North Pole. Um, it's just a star that happens to be um, located near Zenith if you're standing exactly at the North Pole, but it's not exactly there. So it seems to move a little bit. Would you go to the next slide? So um, we describe things on the sky in the same way we describe things on the Earth, except we have to add time in. So every 24 hours, things kind of wrap around and get back to the same location overhead. And uh, in the meantime, we have the same thing as longitude. We have uh, right ascension. So we have just another name for it on the sky. And uh, latitude uh, is the same thing as declination on the sky. So every object in the sky has a longitude and a latitude, um, just like things uh, on the Earth have, uh, sorry, everything in the sky has a right ascension declination, just like the surface of the Earth, we have a longitude and latitude. Uh, but then we have to fold in the fact that the Earth rotates. So can you go to the next one? So um, uh, at a given time, we can you can actually describe things um, by those coordinates. Let's go ahead and skip to the next one. I have a lot of slides about this. 
So <laughs> maybe I have too many slides about this. Yeah, there we go. So once we know we can describe things, uh, we have to say, okay, what about telescopes? So telescopes were invented in like um, 1608. And it didn't take long before, and it wasn't by Galileo. Um, there was actually a Dutchman uh, who invented the first telescope. Uh, but it only took a year before people were figuring out, hey, this is such a great invention. We can use it for all sorts of things, uh, including looking up at the sky. And so he started looking using his first telescope, Galileo, uh, looking at the moon and the sky in 1609. And by the next year, he had already written a book called The Starry Messenger, where he started describing things that he saw in the sky. Okay, and how does that telescope work? Well, it was a telescope that uses lenses. And so it has an objective lens, um, kind of like your eyes, an objective lens, and then it comes down to a focus. And here you need some sort of detector and you could put an eyeball there, or you could put a photographic plate there, you could put something there. So uh, can you go to the next one? But as you make bigger and bigger want to make bigger and bigger telescopes to see fainter and fainter things, um, it's hard to do that with lenses. And so we started using mirrors instead. And so a mirror is similar in that the light comes down and uh, hits uh, the mirror and then comes to a focus at some sort of detector, whether it's an eyepiece or a detector like your phone a camera or some other camera. Uh, and there are all sorts of ways to make it come to focus. So um, the one that we are using tonight is the one in the lower left called Cassegrain. And so it comes and hits the main mirror, which is actually um, nine feet across. So it's a pretty gigantic mirror. And then it goes up to the top of the telescope and then bounces off another mirror and then down into a focus in the hole at the bottom of the telescope. And there's a big instrument that weighs about a ton uh, that hangs off the bottom of the telescope. And so that is our telescope we're using tonight. It's called the Shane Telescope at Lick Observatory. And uh, Evan, can you point to the door in the back there at the railing? Um, this guy here or this one? Oh, right here? Yeah that one so that's yeah. you know that's sort of eight feet tall right so this is a gigantic telescope and uh, mm -hmm. it was the uh, second built biggest in the world in 1959 when it was built so it's three meters across or uh, about nine feet across and it weighs 145 tons so it is a lot of steel it's big and heavy so, uh, but one of the things that's important to understand is that astronomers use telescopes, but they don't build telescopes. So we need engineers and uh, to run telescopes, we need technicians. And all the telescopes that I'm using tonight, all the software interfaces, all that were all um, built by software engineers. And so um, the software people make this telescope go. And we have telescope operators. So it takes kind of a, a small army of people to help one astronomer do their job. And um, so if you're interested in stars, but you're also interested in or galaxies or black holes or planets around other stars, but you're also interested more in software than you are in, um, in being an astronomer, that's okay. We need software people, we need engineers, we need technicians, we need all sorts of people to make astronomy happen. So the cool stuff that we find in astronomy takes a, an army of people. Okay, can you go to the next slide? So, uh, but it also takes an instrument. So a telescope without an instrument is like a car without a motor. So it might look great, uh, but it can't really do much. And so the simplest instrument one can think of is your eye, um, but you could use something better like a camera. So why would a camera be better than your eye? So uh, do you want to try 
thinking about that for a second. You can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Clear pictures, right? So what is it about uh, a picture that's special? Doesn't disappear. That's that's a great answer. I like that answer. So when you uh, take an image with a camera, you can share it with somebody and they don't think you're nuts. If you see a UFO and you go out and claim, I saw a UFO and they say, well, where's the picture? Then people say, well, I didn't see a picture. Then they say, well, then I don't really believe you. Astronomy is the same way. If I see something really exciting in the sky, I see a star that is made out of gold, um, then I have to somehow record the image, take it, and save it so that I can share that information. Okay. So, uh, but images can only tell you so much. So we decided in the image, this is the same one as we saw earlier, that you can see size, you can see position, and you can see color. But that's all you really can tell from this image. You can't tell much else about this just from an image. So there are instruments that, and there's a way of using an instrument that you can tell a lot more about a star. So let's, let's do that. So this is chemical abundances. So you take a star and you take the light from one star and uh, you send it through a prism or some sort of thing that breaks the light out into its component colors. And now you can see something about the red light, the orange light, the yellow light, the green light, the blue light, the indigo light. So, um, yep, go ahead. Okay. So on Earth, we have a telescope and we have a star. Go to the next one. And uh, that star is producing a spectrum and we can take that light and break it up into its colors and see the spectrum of that star. Can we go to the next one? But a star actually has uh, two parts. There's the heat of the star, the hot part of the star inside, and then there's an atmosphere. And the atmosphere actually absorbs some of the light that comes towards us. So the little atoms, um, absorb, and they absorb at spe specific colors and frequencies. And the colors that they absorb at is completely due to the temperature of those atoms and what kind of atom it is. So an iron atom absorbs at different temperatures and wavelengths than a gold atom. And so if I see the absorption from a star, and I know the star's temperature, I can predict where I will see gold, where I will see iron. If I see an absorption feature, a set of absorption features, I can tell you what that star is made out of. Can you go to the next slide? So I don't know if you can see that clearly enough, but the, that little spectrum at the bottom in the middle there now has these little black lines, these black features across it. And so there's kind of one that's strong in the orange region. That one's caused by sodium. And uh, that is also the same element that they put into light bulbs all through San Jose and downtown streets that make those orange glow. So those bulbs are filled with sodium atoms that heat up like a gas and produce orange light. The one that's down in the green, uh, that one there, uh, that one's due to hydrogen. And so uh, hydrogen actually absorbs at a couple of different wavelengths. So that one's due to hydrogen. And if you have really good eyes, you can sort of see down near the blue end, there's sort of a dark set of lines that go across there. Yeah, right at the faintest end that you can see, that one's due to calcium. And so tonight, when we're looking at a spectrum, we're going to be doing this exact same thing. We're going to be looking at the calcium lines, the hydrogen lines, the sodium lines. Those are all things we're going to see in our spectrum tonight. And it's just because stars are made out of the same stuff that we have around us today. Uh, they're made out of silicon. 
They're made out of oxygen. They're made out of hydrogen. That oxygen and hydrogen together is H2O, right? But if you heat it up, it separates and breaks apart and is no longer a molecule. It's now just the atoms, the oxygen and the hydrogen. Okay, let's go to the next one. So that's chemical abundances. So you can use a spectrum, uh, those dark bands, uh, to look for elements uh, in hot gas with a, with a bright background. Okay. Another way to look at it is to turn it on its edge. So now, instead of something being a dark band, it's a, a value that's deep and low in this spectrum. So a bright area would have been up near one, and a dark area would be down near 0.2. And so you, I've labeled things on this uh, particular spectrum. So you can see things are caused by sodium and iron, and SI is silicon, FE is iron, um, BA is barium. So there are a lot of exotic elements uh, that can be found in the spectrum of stars. And all of that stuff is the same stuff that formed our sun or other stars form the planets that go around those stars. Okay, so the instrument we're using tonight is called the CAST spectrograph. And it's on the Shane telescope at Lick Observatory. And you can sort of see the builder there. Um, that, that fellow right there. And um, so you can sort of see it's a big instrument. It sits at the back of the telescope. It's actually two separate cameras. And so we take the light from the star, which comes in from the top where the telescope is and comes down. That's right. And then there's a place there that it splits the light. And it splits it into a blue component and a red component. And so, uh, and then each of those components goes to a prism and splits it and up into its colors and then into a camera. And the reason we have two separate prisms is so that we can look at great detail at the lines in the spectrum. So not just a, a broad one where we see everything from blue to red, uh, this time we'll split it in half and we'll look in great detail at the blue side and the red side. Okay, so um, people have been doing um, spectra of stars, analyzing spectra of stars for a long time. And um, when you tend to get somebody new involved, sometimes they have great innovations and they have a new way of looking at things. And so Annie Jump Cannon uh, was an astronomer at Harvard University. And actually her official title was computer. And so this was before computers. Uh, she was a woman who did calculations and analysis. And so she was a computer, someone who computes things. And um, she started looking at spectra and um, can you go to the next slide? Um, so here is a room full of women computers in 1890. So none of them have computers. Uh, they're all just calculating things with pen and paper and writing down their calculations in books. And then they would share it with, with, uh, with their colleagues. You go to the next one. So here's, a, here's the first star of our story. And uh, can you go one more? Mm -hmm. she came up with a scheme. And so she started looking at spectra and saying, oh, well, I see a whole bunch of different types of spectra. And so I'm just going to label them A, B, C, D, E, F, you know, as they look different. Oh. And so, but it took somebody else to sort of working with uh, another perspective. And uh, she looked at these spectra and said, oh, you know, they're not just ordered in type, but some of them are the blue stars and some of them are the red stars. And so that's what she did. She said, it makes more sense on that classification, the A, B, C, D, E, F, if you arrange them by color. Can you go to the next slide? And so this is the new classification. You have O stars, B stars, A stars, F stars, G stars, K stars, M stars. 
So the big strong lines uh, on the right hand side, um, yeah, that's hydrogen. And so you can sort of see hydrogen is real prominent in the O stars. And, um, and then it starts to go away and disappears by the time you get to G and K stars, you don't see those hydrogen lines anymore. And so when people first started doing this, they said, oh, well, that just means you have some stars that are made out of hydrogen and some stars that have no hydrogen at all. And um, so for about 30 or 40 years, that was the thinking that um, the stars that look like K stars, um, they have things like calcium and iron, uh, but they don't have hydrogen or very little hydrogen. Let me go to the next slide. All right, so then there was an Indian astronomer from India. Um, his last name is Saha. And uh, he came up with another explanation. And that explanation is that uh, atoms uh, are much more complicated than we understand. And as you change the temperature of the star, you ionize and you change what elements and lines can be seen. Can you go to the next line? Um, so that's an ionizing radiation from a star. So the iron lines, um, get ionized, so you don't see those lines in the hot stars. And in the hydrogen lines, um, for the cool stars, all those hydrogens start to form molecules, like CH. And, um, and so all the hydrogen kind of gets bound up in molecules, and so you don't see those lines anymore. Can you go to the next one? Okay, and so... Um, this is a, a woman who um, sort of put it all together. She took the ideas of Saha. She took um, the ideas of the early women computers and she put it all together and sort of synthesized it into one great idea and Cecilia Payne. And can you go to the next one? Yeah. So they say that, okay, by looking at a spectrum, if you see certain lines, you can figure out that all the stars are pretty much made out of the same things to some to first order. But if you don't see hydrogen, yep, go ahead, go to the next one. If you don't see hydrogen lines, um, then you know that um, they have a particular temperature. And if you see um, other lines like sodium, then you know the star has a, a different temperature. If you see um, elements, like there's a CH that's down on the left side. Yep. So if you can see the CH, then you know the hydrogen is starting to transition from being captured by um, by carbon and 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 held there in a molecule rather than in the hydrogen lines. Okay. So. Our sun is a G star. It's about 5,700 degrees, it sort of sits in the middle of the classification. So it's in the Goldilocks kind of zone. It's not too hot where you have a lot of ionizing radiation, which would be bad for the Earth's atmosphere if we were around an O star. And it's not an M star. And if we were around an M star, the Earth would be a frozen ball of snow. Uh, that the atmosphere would freeze because there isn't enough warm heat coming out from the sun to keep us warm. So we are in the Goldilocks zone. It's just right for us um, for, uh, for having a life on our planet and water. Okay. So if you want to remember uh, the order for stars, astronomers say... Uh, o B A F G K M and O B a fine guy kiss me is what I grew up remembering. Uh, but I've also heard it said, Oh, overseas broadcast, a flash, Godzilla kills Mothra, as the way of remembering the order to, to uh, that's there. 
those are mnemonics. They're ways of just remembering um, the order of things and what should be there. There's one for the periodic table that's very complicated and long that I learned when I was in chemistry school so I could try to remember all the elements. Um, okay, so, but as I said, it follows a certain set of rules, um, but for all the rules, there are some exceptions. So not all stars are exactly the same composition. Some are a little different than others, but then there are really big oddball stars and those are carbon stars. And so the spectrum at the top is sort of a normal looking spectrum. Um, so the red is on the right-hand side and the blue is on the left. And uh, the deep line there at, in the top spectrum is calcium. And then there's sort of a carbon line that's next to it. And then a hydrogen line, which is being pointed to now. So, and as you go to different um, amounts of carbon and temperatures, uh, you get slightly different lines. And then you get this bottom spectrum. And this bottom spectrum is a carbon star. This is where the amount of carbon is more than the amount of oxygen. So the molecules that normally would be bound up um, suddenly go out of whack. And you get things like carbon monoxide and C2. And um, so the elements and the molecules just radically change if the amount of carbon gets out of balance with oxygen. And so this project is based to try to understand how common these stars are. So it's easy to find when the carbon is way in excess of the oxygen because the spectrum looks so weird like the bottom one. But we're finding, or we're hoping to find, that there are some cases where it just barely is more carbon than oxygen. And so what do those spectra look like? And can you tell them easily apart? And so we're looking for these oddball things uh, and then trying to find, do they make a nice transition? And why do you get sometimes super carbon heavy ones and do you get ones that are only slightly enhanced by carbon can you go to the next one uh and the next one so well, I think is that the end i think that's it that's it okay so that's what we're trying to do tonight and so i need to turn around and check in uh with our telescope operator and see um see how the weather is and what the outlook is. And in the meantime, if you have any questions, maybe you can put them in the chat or you can raise your hand. So where do we stand? Dan? On the weather front, uh, we have a slight amount of dew and the humidity has not improved. Um, I think you're safe to go back to your question and answer period for another half hour when we wait and see what it's going to do. Okay. Sounds good. Um, it's not really a TV, but call a camera fix. So uh, that much at least is positive. Okay. When you do, please let me know and maybe I'll take some um, some calibrations while the um, while we're waiting. Sounds good. Um, yeah, give me about three minutes and I'll start getting back. All right. So there is a camera that we use that um, we use for guiding. Uh, actually, you can stop sharing, uh, Evan. Here we mm -hmm. go. So, um, so let me share the desktop. So this is my desktop. Um, and so we can sort of see the humidity here. You can see the sun is has set and uh, there is some thin clouds and uh, there are some other cameras we could look at. And so you can sort of see the, 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 the sky is still bright in the west. Uh, this is, a, this is the, another telescope on the mountain. And let's try this one. 
Yeah, now we can look out at San Jose and see that there are some clouds off in the distance that are thicker. Maybe I will share just that desktop for a moment. Okay, so um, you can sort of see San Jose and um, the lights of San Jose are orange, uh, largely, and that's the sodium lamps. And uh, the sky images, whoops, all sky. So that one is showing this strange modeled pattern here, and that's due on the little dome that is on this camera that's looking up. So um, it's a little lens that allows you to sort of see the whole sky, uh, but you can sort of see it's all fuzzed over and that's because of humidity. So at the moment we're humidity out. Yeah, that's not showing anything, okay. All right, and so we're going to wait a little bit and see if the humidity improves. Um, I'm not very optimistic. As the temperature goes down, the humidity tends to go up. So, and usually when the sun sets, uh, the temperature goes down. So uh, things get more humid. Okay, I'm going to stop for a moment and see if anyone has questions. And those questions could be for about what we're doing, about what I talked about, or they could be for Evan and Ivan about going to UCSC, going to college, okay. um, those types of questions. Okay. Right. Thank you, Dan. Okay. So uh, he just told me that he fixed the camera that we will be using tonight. So um, things are looking good there. And uh, just the humidity is not cooperating. And so what I'm going to do is share the screen up here and I'm going to take a spectrum. Before and... we go on, we have one question in the chat. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, they ask, how is working generally with the telescope? So, how, um, how do you enjoy it? Oh, uh, <laughs> I love working on this telescope. And um, I love going out to the telescope. And it's it's a nicer experience to actually be out at the telescope and um, using it. Um, but there is it, it is also nice to be able to just go to your own bed at the end of the night. So this night, um, I will stay up, even if it's cloudy, even if it's humid, I'll be staying up until four o'clock in the morning, uh, at least. Um, just to make sure that the last little bit of the night doesn't clear off and I can use it. So, um, you know, the, the telescope time, this telescope is sort of, it costs about $7,000 a night to operate it. Uh, that's the employees, that's the power, that's everything. Um, so i I love running this telescope and because it is a valuable resource, you have to try to make use of every little bit of it. So we'll be staying up late just to see if I can use an hour of the telescope time at the end of the night. Do I believe in aliens? So um, yes, I believe in aliens, but I don't believe in aliens on earth. So um, I believe that there are, um, life out in our universe so the the number of stars almost every single star that you see in the sky has at least one planet going around it 
And um, there will be some fraction of those, which will be uh, planets that are going around their stars far enough away that the um, that the ionizing radiation allows them to have an atmosphere and it's not too hot and water can form and not too far away that they get cold. And so even if uh, one in a thousand of those stars that you can see has a planet in the Goldilocks zone, you know, they all have planets. Um, so then one in a thousand will have a one in a Goldilocks zone. And then maybe one in a thousand of those uh, will be able to form life. So that's one in 10,000. And there are a one with 12 zeros after it, number of stars in our galaxy alone. And if you divide that by 10,000, that only takes off six zeros. So that's one with six zeros behind it. So there are lots of planets in our galaxy that will likely have life in it. So, but it's very hard as our understanding of physics allows for those people to get outside their solar system and travel anywhere. It's just really hard to do. Yes, I, I watched a video recently and we've only been visible uh, cosmically for maybe 50 years at most, you know, because the fastest we can send a signal out is with light. And so we had this kind of 60 light year bubble around the earth. Anything past that, people can't see us because light hasn't had enough time to travel from earth outward. So we have this very, very small bubble around us that we can actually, you know, people might be able to see us. To see our technology. Yeah, see our technology. That's right. And so what we're what we're trying to do in the meantime is uh, so there are people who are working on trying to see technological evidence of life in the universe outside our solar system. But you can also look for biological evidence of life. So what do you think might be a biological evidence of life on Earth as seen from space? Any guesses? Any ideas? So one of them is uh, what plants do. They make oxygen. Right. They make oxygen. So CO2 is a very common element and it's very long lasting. It hangs around a long time. So um, plants can take CO2 and turn it into power for themselves and then emit a byproduct, oxygen. And oxygen is not particularly all that stable and long lasting because rust, right? Things rust, they oxidize. And so, and oxygen tends to want to wander around and find things like hydrogen atoms and turn into water. So oxygen, if you could go off and uh, find another planet and then take a spectrum of that planet and look to see if you can see oxygen. And that might be evidence of some sort of biological process going on in that planet. People for a while thought methane might be another one, but methane's tricky because um, on cold planets, methane sticks around a long time, but on warm planets, it doesn't. So it might be a technological or biological signature on a warm planet, but not on a cold planet. So, um, so methane is produced by what, cow burps and by fracking, uh, oil production, um, and sometimes by volcanoes. All right, so that was a long answer to aliens. Uh, I got distracted. So, okay. Um, feel free to distract me again.
Oh, I saw that there was a question right as I was sharing. It was how realistic do you think Interstellar is? Interstellar, like the science fiction show? Isn't that Interstellar? That, that's what I was thinking of. Uh, so which one is Interstellar? Is that the one with the black holes? Yes, yes. Okay, right. So um, there are bits of that which were realistic and bits that were really wrong. Um, so the bits that were, one of the bits that was really wrong is that they got the time dilation part really wrong. The, the, the idea right, but the technical details wrong. So if you go to a planet that's around a black hole and you go and land on it and spend a day there and leave, I think like seven years had passed on the show or something like that. And uh, that amount of time dilation would have ripped that planet. It would have been too close to the black hole and it would have been not a good planet. So time dilation definitely happens. Um, so they got that part right. And the idea that you could pass through a wormhole, we have never produced a wormhole. We've never seen a wormhole. We have seen now black holes, but we don't know if wormholes are a real thing. So they might be, it's mathematically possible that they could be a real thing, but um just because something's mathematically possible doesn't mean it's actually possible in physics. Okay. I can keep relaying questions to you while you work on the VNC screen. Okay. All right. So, uh, but uh, actually, Evan and Ivan, if you have different opinions uh, or ideas about any of that, that I, I said, feel free to, to pipe up. I'm sure they don't want to hear just me talking. <laughs> no, I, th I think you hit it spot on. I, I liked the movie personally, but um, I think, yeah. I, I didn't know that about how, how wrong they got the um, time dilation part. Yeah. it's the, the title effect was beautiful, though, that they produced, that they were standing on this planet that had water, Mm -hmm. And as they the planet rotated around towards the black right. hole, this gigantic wall of water um, could be seen. And it was highly exaggerated about what it would really look like, but um, at least they had the huge tidal effects mm -hmm. kind of in there, even though they um, might have glorified it to make it super cool. <laughs> Right. I mean, we have tidal effects here on Earth, right? It's the same exact concept. That's right. Except, you know, we're not around a black hole. That's yes. Making and dark tides are caused largely by the moon and mm -hmm. partly by the sun. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I am going to take a little test exposure. And I have two cameras, so I do a start exposure in two locations. And you hear that bell. So the we make the telescope software make sounds at us. And that is because when you're observing and you it ends up being two or three o'clock in the morning, you tend to fall asleep and not remember that you're starting an exposure. And so the little bell sounds are all there to remind you, hey, something is happening, wake up, pay attention. And um, we can actually change what sound we like. Um, I like bells, so they, they wake me up. But you could make it a human voice. You could make it a cow bell. You could make it a, um, a phaser sound from Star Trek. There's That's lots of my favorite. I like that one. The Star Trek ones, those are fun. Yeah, I'm, I think, let's see, how do you... Uh, I can't remember how you make it. Exposure complete. <laughs> okay. Uh, where's the phaser? If you could turn up the volume just a little bit. 
Okay, let's see. Turn up the volume. And that one's a little gross. So, uh, but do you remember what the phaser is called? I don't. I think John played it once or twice. Let's see. Uh, yeah, that that would wake me up, but I don't think that's a very good sound to use for uh, when you're operating the telescope. Because oh, there oh, it is. Yeah, photon. Yes. <laughs> Our telescope operator on the other Zoom call said uh, it got his attention because it sounded like <laughs> something was breaking in the other room. That's funny. All right. So uh, all of these sounds. Um, oh, well, that wasn't the one I remember, but. Uh, I think it's supposed to be cowbell. Where's cowbell? There we go. Okay, so we can turn um, we can turn those sounds up, so I can hear things happening, and then a spectrum is generated. And so right now, this is a spectrum that's that is created from a hot solid source, and so there is no absorption. It is um, just a rainbow, and uh, I've given artificial colors. Uh, but blue is on this side and red is on this side. And here's another one. This is the other side. Uh, and here it is. Now I can't remember. Um, I guess blue is down here and red is up here on these artificial color scheme. And so this is what a flat lamp looks like. And so what is a flat lamp? A flat lamp is just a solid lamp that produces a constant spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so um, you can sort of, what we use it for is that the detector we're using is imperfect. And maybe if I share just the, just the one screen, you can get a little more detail. Um, this one. Okay, sharing just this one, and maybe you can sort of see the little round circles and the little dots that are all across here. Can you see those? Uh, I can see them, yeah. You zoom in a okay. little bit. Uh, oh, yeah, that's I'll a zoom good zoom that is. There, so there we go. go. Okay, so I forgot I can zoom in. <laughs> so um, all of those are flaws on the detector. And so because we're trying to create and look for subtle changes in a spectrum, we don't want the detector to be throwing us off. And so we create a flat lamp that should have a constant correction, but it doesn't. So we can divide by this and it corrects out the, the relative sensitivity of uh, these pixels versus these pixels. Yeah. So basically, if you know where the bad pixels are, you can tell the computer, ignore those areas, and you can subtract them out. Right. Okay. So that's one type of lamp. Uh, turn those off. And then I can turn on a lamp that has um, gases in it. So now, instead of a solid producing, like a solid, like the center of the sun producing light, it is a hot gas, and so it produces um, a different kind of spectrum. And this should be 10 seconds and 20 seconds. Something down. Oops. That window that Matthew was just messing with was the, that's the actual interface that you use to tell the telescope to take a picture. I just remembered that I hadn't moved over to point at the lamp. It was still pointed at the hot lamp. 
So I will tell it to take another spectrum. Yeah. So inside the telescope, what he's referring to is there's lots of different mirrors you can move in and out to point at different things um, that are all within the telescope for the calibrations. And uh, he just forgot to flip a mirror. Five seconds remaining. Okay, so here is the spectrum. And now, uh, as opposed to that solid band, now we have just emission lines. And this is sort of the opposite of the absorption lines that we showed earlier, where you had a hot background, like the center of the sun, and then colder gas on the outside. Now we just have a hot gas pumped up with electricity and it produces a spectrum. And I will share the other one because it's nicer looking. Um, let's see, maybe I'll share the whole desktop. So here's another spectrum over here. Uh, move it over a little bit and create a column. And so this is what the spectrum looks like. It's just a cut through here. It looks like emission, um, a bunch of lines. And so I use this uh, because I know what gases are in that those lamps. There's a helium. There's a neon. Um, argon, a bunch of gases. Um, I know what gases are in there, so I know what the color or wavelength is of each of these lines. And so it allows me to calibrate the position of the spectrum from the star. Okay, so two types of calibrations. Um, if we get a spectrum of a star, then I would apply those calibrations to ignore certain pixels because they're more sensitive or least sensitive. Um, and then I can tell it for every pixel what the color is. It's you know exactly emerald green or put it on a mathematical scale. It's exactly 5,577.3 angstroms um, in position. And then I can create a spectrum. And um, and at the end, I might end up with a spectrum that looks like that from a star. And That's then I can the start looking at it and trying to figure out what the star is made out of and whether it has uh, too much carbon which is what Ivan is looking for, stars with lots of carbon. Okay. Um, so uh, let's see, the weather is, you know, humidity is actually higher now than it was earlier. So that's not looking promising. Um, questions for Evan, more questions for me or Evan or Ivan? I like the alien ones. Those are fun. <laughs> yeah. And, so Ivan, you haven't, you haven't oh. said much. So Ivan, tell, tell, uh, me or tell us, uh, how you decided you wanted to do physics. <laughs> Yeah, so um, my path to do physics was a bit of a weird one because I went to UC Santa Cruz like wanting to do a video game design. And then I took, I think it was my first like Python class and I didn't like it too much. But I I learned to, to get used to it. And I just kind of thought like, since I wanted to keep doing something that I like, I knew for sure that I liked. So then I thought back to high school where, although I wasn't the best at it, I when I took my intro physics class, I did like it. 
So it just kind of transitions into that. Yeah. That's good. Do something you like. Yeah. Very true. That's good advice. Evan, how about you? How do you decide that you wanted to do physics? Uh, it was a similar concept. Um, I had a really great physics teacher in high school and me and him got along really well and we would argue a lot in class over physics and things. And um, so then when applying for college, I was looking for something like uh, aerospace engineering but Santa Cruz didn't have aerospace engineering. They had astrophysics. And I thought, well, that's got to be the next best thing. <laughs> and um, and so I ended up doing astrophysics here. And I absolutely love it. Great. Yeah. Although it has not been easy. Yeah. It, there's <laughs> a lot of math. There's a lot of math. Uh-huh. Is the math the hard thing or is the physics the hard thing? You know, that's, I think that's a million dollar question right there. I don't know what's harder, the physics or the math? Because <laughs> you can't do the physics without the math, but you can't understand the physics or you can't understand the math without the physics. You know, they're interrelated. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so... Um... Let's see, what else? Um, so we've taken some calibrations and, um, oh, didn't, let's see. So it's this one. So the targets for tonight, uh, I've loaded into a list. They all have a funny long name and, but they have coordinates right ascension declination. So um, remember that's sort of like longitude and latitude, um, but you have to wrap in the fact that uh, for longitude, what matters is what time it is right now. And so um, the, the hour angle what we have is how far over something is in degrees. Um, air mass, parallactic angle, I shouldn't have zenith distance. And so it's important, you know, knowing what time it is now, because although the stars are relatively stationary in the sky, you know, if you're outside of Earth and looking at the stars, they're relatively stationary, but Earth is spinning. So the stars that we're going to see are going to change as our time changes. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so Evan spent um, part of this last summer as an intern up at Lick Observatory learning about the telescopes and um, also working with the public a little bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Doing public programs up there. Mm -hmm. So um, so Evan knows this telescope pretty well. <laughs> yeah, so this was basically most of my nights where I would I was looking at the screen, I was sitting in the telescope operator room and I had the telescope operator next to me and we're pushing buttons and one of the resident astronomers who actually knows what they're doing who's trying to teach me, no, 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 wrong button. And, you know, okay, first send to this, then go to here. Um, yeah, it was a good time. So, um... Certain objects will be overhead right now. And um, so the current sidereal time, so the time that is overhead is 22 hours. So that means things that have right ascensions near 22 hours are near overhead. And so um, unless they're very far south or very far north. So if we wanted to go to an object, um, I could send this over to the telescope operator and ask him to move the telescope. Of course, he might be willing to move the telescope, but he would not be willing to open the dome because it's very humid outside and we have to keep the telescope from getting wet um, because the glass will get stained. Uh, and then eventually, 
I can bring up a chart about the area we would find, see on the sky. And this is this star that we're going after. And we have marked it on this chart so that we, and this is the area we would all, we would see, but there's a bunch of stars in that field and we have to know which one we want. So the coordinates of the star that I want is that one. Um, so, but we have a finding chart, uh, kind of like a map, um, to tell us where we need to go. Okay, so why why am I showing you all of this if you're not interested in being an astronomer? So <laughs> I'm showing you all of this. Um, I know that uh, the goal here is not to make 18 astronomers. Uh, the goal is to let you know that this is the way astronomers do science, and it's not radically different from... Um, you know, the way a biologist or a physicist might do, or um, somebody working in a laboratory. My laboratory has a gigantic telescope. Somebody else's laboratory might have a gigantic microscope <laughs> um, to look at very small things as opposed to very giant things. So, uh, but the process is just a set of steps, a set of calibrations to make sure that you understand you put in a set of variables and you get out the what you're expecting and you're like, they don't exactly look like that. So that's probably something you have to correct for. And uh, so some calibrations, you do calibrations. When you tune a car, you have a calibrating um, set of, of wrenches or you have a calibrating computer that tells you exactly the timing the car needs to be at. So there's, it's just a set of procedures and you go to school to learn those procedures and how to apply them. And then you bring your perspective to doing the work, the science. But if you don't like the work, you're not gonna be a very good astronomer. So if you find yourself not interested in the thing you go after, you go after something else. But I just wanna show you that there's no mystery about the way we do astronomy. It's not a black box. It's not some mysterious thing that's up on a mountaintop that does uh, amazing things. Yes, it does do amazing things, but um, anyone can learn to do those amazing things. Yes, I think Ivan brings up a really good point and that, you know, do something that you want to do and something you're inspired by. And if you're in college and you discover that's not for you, then you change and you go and do, you know, from computer programming to physics or drama or whatever it is. Yeah, when you when you like something, you definitely become a lot more willing to do it no matter how difficult it is. <laughs> So what's your hardest class right now, Ivan? Uh, I'd say it's definitely quantum. Quantum uh, mechanics. Yeah. So what's the weirdest thing that you're learning about quantum mechanics? Mm -hmm. See, for me, it's the, the class has been just kind of hard to understand. Like I get things a bit, a bit later than I'm supposed to. Uh, yeah, quantum is very strange physics. Mm -hmm. It's um, it's counterintuitive in a lot of ways. So, um, let's take a look at the sky. Um, Okay, so still some clouds that might be fog off in the distance. Uh, let's go back and see. We look towards San Jose. Maybe those are just low clouds and not fog.
Yeah, that's definitely just. Say that again, Dan. So up on his screen right now, you can see Matthew's, the camera here on the left, which is an actual camera that's up on the mountain. It's pointing towards the sky. But on the right here, we have all of these readouts from different weather measuring devices all over the mountain that the telescope's on. And um, it's very important to have an accurate reading of what the weather is like, because the weather is bad. You can damage your very, very expensive telescope. Um, lots of people will be very mad at you. Um, so we have to take good care of our instrument. Um, that's what you're seeing there on the right. All these different numbers are humidity and wind and pressure. Um, there's the measurement of particles that are in the air down at the bottom there. Um, all very important stuff. Yeah, so if the if the winds are too strong, uh, right now they're in the green. So these are light winds as far as the observatory is concerned. If they start to get up near 40 miles an hour or 50 miles an hour, then we have to um, either turn the telescope downwind or close it so that the big giant telescope doesn't get beat up by the wind and the gears get stripped. And um, so then we can also look at precipitation and temperature. Um, we don't have really closure for temperature, but if it gets too, too cold, um, it's rare, but if it gets super cold up there, then things start misbehaving. Some of the electronics don't participate very well. The, the oils and the greases start to thicken up. And so the gears don't work particularly well. Um, I worked at other observatories in the past and um, I had nights where we had to shut down the telescope because it became, it was minus 10 degrees and the greases were just not letting the mechanisms move properly. And we're worried about, you know, two big motors pushing hard on something that didn't want to move and then breaking something. So we ended up shutting down telescopes because they got too cold. Um, but it's you can design a telescope to work at extremely cold temperatures. Um, they have telescopes in Antarctica, and uh, which is a great place in the winter time to do science because a night there is you know five months long. Um, so that's that makes for a very long night. Of course, in the summer you don't do a lot of astronomy because it's um, sun's up all the time, even though it's low on the horizon. So we have a question in chat. Uh -huh. um, it says, uh, how can the temperature affect the telescope in the summer? That's a good question. So um, the, the, there's two parts there. If, if um, during the day, we try to keep the temperature inside the dome cool because when uh, you open the dome, um, it's like when you look across a hot road and you see all those wavy heat lines coming up off of the road, um, it distorts your view of the road. And you can actually get mirages. Uh, like It looks like water on the road. It's because it's a mirage. It's a reflection of the sky. So those heat distortions are very bad for your vision, long distance vision. Um, and so the same is true for us. If we have a very hot dome and it's cool outside, um, then that's bad for us to, to see the sky clearly. Um, all of our images get distorted. And we call that seeing. And that actually is one of the things that causes stars to twinkle. Another thing to consider, although maybe not directly related, is that when that you know the forest around the telescope gets very hot and things get very dry there's the increased possibility of wildfires and so during my time with the telescope in the summertime there were a few instances where we'd have to close down because smoke from wildfires was blowing in over the telescope and that's very bad because you get little particulate matter you know ash and things like that landing on the telescope which can be damaging to its mirror the other part of Will's question, Matthew, 
is um, I've also heard that it snows up there. So why did we decide to build the telescope there? Right, that's a good question. So uh, this is actually the first observatory ever built on a mountaintop permanently. And the reason is, is because the that the you're above the clouds, some of the clouds, like in San Jose, if you were building a telescope in San Francisco, you wouldn't open very often because you would be foggy most of the time. So you want to get somewhere dry. So deserts and tops of mountains are drier than uh, other areas. So that's one reason. Another is that the amount of atmosphere you're looking through is less. And so the turbulence in the atmosphere is less. And so the stars twinkle less. So your image of the sky is better. The first place they considered building the this observatory, Lick Observatory, was actually out in the Sierra Nevada mountains and up near Reno. And they considered building there, and but uh, they tried to go and measure it, and they couldn't get the carriages, the horses and the carriages, up to the mountain because they had eight feet of snow, and they just couldn't get there. And so they decided, nope, okay, mountaintops are okay, but we want a mountaintop that doesn't get a lot of snow. So this mountaintop is a pretty good one. It gets a little bit of snow once in a while, uh, but usually it doesn't last more than four or five days and goes away. This last winter was really unusual. We had a lot more snow than normal, and it stuck around a lot longer than normal. Uh, but most observatories are found on now, uh, are found on mountaintops, uh, and are found in deserts. So lots in Arizona, for example. Also important to remember that uh, this observatory, Lick Observatory, was built in 1880. So it's a very, very old observatory. Um, and uh, when Matthew was talking about how they couldn't get their horse and carriages up there, it was because they didn't have cars back then. They rode around on horses. Um, yeah. Right. And the first telescope that was built up here, um, it didn't have electricity because... That wasn't a common thing to, you know, there are no electrical lines to to run up from anywhere to here, uh, to the observatory to, to create electrical. So everything was human powered or water powered. They actually had tanks of water that uh, would drive um, pressure and allow things to move. So I see another question about, uh, how much maintenance has to be done on the telescope a day or a month? So that is a great question. Um, and in fact, the, the fellow who is uh, babysitting the telescope right now, his name is Dan, and he just got a promotion and is now in charge of all of the maintenance and uh, work that is done. And so let's see. Uh, Hey, Dan, you want to say something about how often you're doing maintenance and what that, does that maintenance look like or sound like? I don't know whether people would be able to hear me well, but uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, there's probably about two hours of what I'd call housekeeping, going around, clearing the last night's data off disks, filling the doors, setting up the optics for the new observer. Uh, testing everything, make sure it runs. So that's about two hours out of my day. And uh, then there's typically a major project like greasing all the wheels. You would not believe the number of wheels and bearings there are up here. Uh, so one of my major tasks, I would say probably an hour a day averaged over the year is just running around with a grease gun, keeping everything lubricated. Um, then there's upgrade projects and long-term projects like the uh, the shutter drive on this dome needs a new set of gears. So I'm busy trying to get the information together to figure out what gears we need. Um, there's also cables that stretch and they need to be retensioned and electronics that misbehave and need to be restarted. So I would say taking care of the 
nine or ten telescopes that run up here is it is a full time job for one guy, um, and could probably keep two people pretty busy trying to get up ahead of some of the maintenance and do some of the upgrades they'd like to do. They can hear you just fine. That was great. Thank you, Dan. So I, I will say one other thing about Dan is that in his in his spare time he uh, likes to help out astronomers who have super cool ideas. And one of the super cool ideas that a astronomer from UC San Diego came up with is a hunt for alien technology communications by laser. We're just coming into the point where we can communicate with other parts of our solar system with laser communication. We send a little pulse and that pulse contains information, uh, but it passes along past the thing that we're trying to communicate with off into the cosmos. And so it looks like just a pulse of light very fast. So we might look for alien laser pulses. And uh, so there is a woman, um, Shelly Wright, who came up with a technology for looking for super fast pulses from the nighttime sky. And she brought a prototype there to the observatory. And the team here has, or the team up at Lick has been great about supporting her, her concept for building this out. And so Dan has been working to get their dome to work better and get it all set up so that they can scan the nighttime sky looking for those signatures. So it is called Pano SETI. And, um, Maybe it will discover something exciting. All right, uh, let's see. So there is another question. Um, would it be better to put a telescope in warm or cold climate? And um, so the ideal location is cold because um, there is different colors of light, right? You've got red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And violet goes on to ultraviolet and then to X-ray and gamma ray. And the things that are UV and X-ray and gamma ray, they don't make it through the atmosphere. And at the other end of the spectrum, beyond orange and red, goes infrared. And so infrared allows you to see at night, for example, or even further into the infrared, you can see things emitting heat. Heat is a form of infrared radiation, and so you can see heat. And so if you want to look for a cool planet uh, next to a hot star, you might look in the infrared to see that planet um, because it's, it's cold. Uh, but because the Earth glows also, it means that the telescope glows. And so it's hard to detect things in outer space that are the same temperature as our own planet. And so putting things in a cold location like Antarctica or the top of a mountain, um, one of the best mountain tops in the world is Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And uh, it is typically around 32 degrees, right at freezing, year round. And uh, so it's stable and high altitude. So there's not a lot of water up there and it's cold. So it's a great place to do infrared work. And of course, Antarctica is even better, uh, but you have to get to Antarctica and it's a long way away. And it's very unhospitable to work there. So cold is usually a better place for telescopes than hot, even though we want to be in a desert. We want it to be dry and cold. So we want cold deserts. We're real picky. These are all great questions. Yeah, they are good questions. We have one more saying, um, are stars mostly big or small? Um. So 
that's a trick question uh so most stars are small um but small stars are cold and faint and so they're hard to find so there's more of them but they are cold and faint so it's the uh evan can you bring up the slides again do you still have those handy yes here there's one that has the different spectral types the O B A fine girl kiss me these guys or yeah is this what you're looking for um that one will do so okay. that's good so uh the little stars are also cold so 3500 their size is small and a hot star is big and this is when it's burning hydrogen and helium inside its core and then when it runs out of gas when it runs out of hydrogen in its core stars go through a midlife crisis and they become gigantic stars giant stars so they swell up even bigger than they are already and so even a g-type star like our sun would become a giant star and become as big as an O-type star or even bigger. And um, it will become our star when it runs out of fuel, runs out of hydrogen burning in its center, will go through this phase of becoming a giant and the outer part of the star will actually almost reach the orbit of the Earth. It will certainly reach the orbit of Venus and the the sun will eat the planet venus so uh it would be a good idea for us to get off this planet by the time our sun runs out of of um, hydrogen in its core so that's the bad news the good news is that it's going to take about four billion years for that to happen and so the sun has been around for about five billion years so it's halfway through its life of burning hydrogen into helium. So we have a long way to go. <laughs> so okay. most stars are those cool stars, but they're hard to find and they're little. That so also means say, that, uh -huh, oh, go ahead. Oh, okay. As this is not to say that the star is small compared to us though. By any means. No, it's still bigger than Jupiter. Jupiter is like a failed star. You know, it's got lots of gas, and the inside of Jupiter is hot and glowing, but it's not quite hot enough to cause hydrogen to fuse, but it's slowly cooling off. So Jupiter is sort of like a failed star. But if you became like, three five times bigger than jupiter then you start to be right at the point where you're no longer a planet and you're at the smallest type of star so it's sort of big jupiter kind of things um but those cool stars their goldilocks zone of where the planets have to be have to be super close to that star in order to get enough warmth to make liquid water on their surface. So if you replaced our sun with, um, with an M type star, the Goldilocks zone would be kind of close to where Mercury is. So it says here, uh, what do you think are your most significant research accomplishments. So um, I am a cosmochemist, a galactic archeologist. So uh, what I do is I look at all of the stars in our solar, in our galaxy and try to figure out how they move, where they came from, um, where they were, born where they're going and 
what I am known for is the work that I have done on how chemical evolve with time. And so the universe started with the Big Bang, with all hydrogen and helium, and then stars formed. And inside the star, hydrogen gets turned to helium, and then helium into carbon, and carbon into um, oxygen and silicon, and silicon into iron. And then when the star explodes, it can make things that are heavier, like gold and uranium and platinum. And so the, that process um, I tested by looking at little baby galaxies that are around our own to see if I can make heads or tails of how chemistry evolved in those environments and whether it's the same as our galaxy or different. And what I found was that it's similar, but slow very slow chemical evolution. So things are made, still made on the periodic table. Everything that we know is on the periodic table. Um, but the process of getting there took um, much, much longer. So it's um, sort of chemically old fashioned. And so this is all using the stuff that we've been talking about today, right? With spectroscopy right. and Taking... the light from stars. But I guess in this case, it's galaxies. No, it's individual stars okay. in those galaxies. Because okay. okay. they're nearby. So you can okay. just see them. So you're absolutely right. So it's taking an image of those galaxies that are nearby, finding all their stars, where they're located, and then going and taking a spectrum of them and seeing what chemistry I can find there and whether uh, how much iron they have and how much carbon they have and um, discovering that they are um, like the lost world. They're dinosaurs, they're uh, chemically, they're unevolved or not as evolved as, as our neck of the woods. Well, I'm really sorry that uh, the humidity continues to be high and um, misbehaving as it is. Um, we have, there is another La Noche Night um, that is going to be in January that we will tell your teachers about. Um, but this one we have promised will be in Spanish, which uh, Ivan is fluent in and I am not. <laughs> and so Ivan will be leading a lot of the discussion and um, I will be here to back him up as he talks about it. So it will be the same kind of project. We will try, if we don't open tonight and observe any stars, we will be observing the stars we had wanted to observe tonight in January. Uh, but it will be a similar night. And hopefully, if you join then, um, we can, of course, answer in either English or Spanish and um, and show maybe if we open the telescope then. Weather is one of those unfortunate things about astronomy is you just can't control it. You can't really predict it that well. I just got to work around it. Mm -hmm. And be patient. And be patient. That's right. Any other questions for us about college life or internships or I mean, I'd be happy to talk about my time at the mountain if that's sure. Okay. Well, um, so 
my summer I spent at this observatory that um, Matthew was showing the pictures of, um, you know, on the mountain and the cameras. And I would go up there maybe every other week or so and stay for three or four days on the mountaintop. So there are people who live up there full time. They, uh, you know, they have all, they have their family up there. They have houses. Um, they don't have a grocery store or anything like that. They have to go down into San Jose to get food and stuff, but people live up there full time. Uh, I, I think there's something like 40 or 30 people who live up there full time. Right, Matthew? Right. Um, yeah. And so I would go up there about every other week stay for a few days. They have a dormitory there for astronomers that uh, were coming up to observe on the telescopes. And I essentially did a similar process to this, but in person where I would shadow one of the scientists who was working up there. They have three resident astronomers who are there and they're, you know, they know everything there is to know about these telescopes. Um, they're the troubleshooters and teachers up there. And I would sit with them while they did their science and they'd show me how to use the telescope, um, all the different tasks that you need to do beforehand, and then how to actually operate the telescope during the night. And then I had a few science projects that I wanted to work on uh, that were both helping their science and doing some of the science of my own. So we did things like look at quasars, which are galaxies. They're very active galaxies that are, so we have our Milky Way galaxy and we sit inside of it. There's a whole bunch of galaxies all around us are close by. And some of those galaxies were pointed straight on and we're seeing their very bright, very active cores and it's spewing light at us and radiation and stuff like that. And so we're doing a similar process to this where we're looking at the spectrum and the light that's coming off these galaxies, measuring it using the same instrument that we're talking about here tonight um, to try and learn more about it. And, so, and uh, what causes that bright light? Uh, there are giant black holes at the center of these galaxies, at the center of all galaxies. Um, and when they eat up a whole bunch of material, they shoot these jets out from the poles of the black hole and those jets is pointed at us and we're sometimes they're pointed at us that's called a blazar but when they're pointed like this and we can observe them that's called a, a quasar and that's what we were looking at so kind of looking at black holes kind of looking at galaxies um yeah uh so that was a very fun project spent a lot of time on that and then we also worked on a project where we're trying to find, we wanted to make a program that could measure the background sky brightness. So the sky itself, it looks dark, but there's a little bit of light that's bouncing around inside of our atmosphere. And that can be from things like the moon that's bouncing off of earth, or it can be from the lights down in San Jose that uh, kind of add to this ambient light in the dark sky. Um, and we wanted to make a program that would be able to measure how bright the background is. And then we can subtract that brightness off of our actual science images. So we can create a better contrast between our science objects and the dark night sky. Um, so that was some programming. Uh, so I, my, my Python skills were definitely pushed to the test. Um, but yes, uh, there's, there's a question in chat here that says, has pollution affected your astronomy research? And most definitely, um, that's a very big and active uh, part of astronomy research is, you know, how do we mitigate the light pollution from cities? Uh, San Jose, they've they have an initiative to replace some of the street lights and things with sodium bulbs. Uh, I believe that's what Matthew was talking about earlier. And yeah, see, here we go. 
So all of that light is affecting our research. It's a, it's a real issue because it messes with our spectrum when we have a bunch of stray light. Um, and so part of what San Jose is doing is they're replacing street lamps with sodium light bulbs. And sodium light bulbs release a very distinct spectrum. And so when we know exactly where those spectral lines, those dark bands, if you remember from the slideshow, where those are at. And so if we see them on our science image, we can just subtract them out. And it's almost as if that light isn't there anymore. Um, <clears throat> but you're right. It's very, it's an ongoing issue. Um, yeah. And, and it's other types of pollution as well, mm -hmm. more than just light. So if people produce a lot of um, um, dust and um, coal smoke, Mm -hmm. And another observatory I used to work with, we could see the Ohio River Valley smoke come down the Mississippi, out into the Gulf of Mexico, across uh, into Mexico, and then up into Texas. Um, we could actually track the particles, the type of coal particles that were being produced. Wow. And so it actually was... And, and those reflect a lot of light. Particles do dust. It's like dust. Mm -hmm. And so um, we could actually see more than just light pollution. We could actually see true particulate pollution. So um, there were a couple other questions. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I've heard that another galaxy near us will merge with ours in uh, in a very long time. Can you explain how that works? So um, the fundamental force that builds everything in our universe is gravity. And gravity grabs things that are massive and pulls them together. And the further something is away, the weaker its pull is on it. And so it tends to grab things that are nearby and pull them in. And so when a galaxy forms, uh, part of a little galaxy sort of starts to build up and then it sees a little piece over here and it grabs it and pulls it in and it cannibalizes it, it eats it. So it grows. And so it kind of grows and grabs things and grabs things. And, and finally it starts running out of things to grab and it sort of sets down into a kind of a quiescent state, a, a, a calm state where it just kind of keeps forming stars, but nothing chaotic. And nearby, over here, there is another galaxy that's doing exactly the same thing from when it was born. So it grabbed things and put them nearby. That's the Andromeda galaxy. It's our big sister. It's a little bit bigger than our galaxy, but it's in kind of this quiet part of the universe that allows the galaxy to slowly add small things to itself and form a big, beautiful spiral galaxy. And in um, several billion years, these two are, because of the forces of gravity, are pulling on each other, trying to bring them in. And eventually the two will crash into each other and distort and merge eventually because that's what gravity does. It tries to grab things. If they're moving apart, it tries to slow them down. Um, if it's not moving fast enough, then it'll eventually grab things and pull it all together. So yes, uh, Andromeda and our galaxy will merge um, and all the big fluffy gas clouds will um, run into each other and like clouds in our um, own atmosphere when two big cloud fronts run into each other you tend to get thunderstorms and things happen and so uh, things precipitate out of it in this in our case it's raindrops and in space it's stars 
two big gas clouds run into each other, they precipitate into stars. The stars themselves, they don't care so much. Uh, they just go running through. They're like airplanes. They just go right through a cloud. They don't, they don't particularly care that there's a cloud there. Um, so nothing will bad would necessarily happen to the individual stars, but the big gas clouds uh, would certainly get a lot of work. Okay, uh, there's a question about um, what do I think about zodiac signs and what's your sign? And so, um, you know, that's astrology, right? That That's a different word than astronomy, but they have the same origin. It's the study of the stars and how the stars influence us. And so um, astrology was sort of invented by each of the cultures on our planet. And we tend to adopt uh, one set of those in our Western culture, which comes from uh, partly from the Greeks and partly from the uh, Arabic culture. And um, those zodiac signs uh, are where the sun happens to be when you're born. And so, um, Evan, what, what sign are you? I'm Cancer. You're Cancer. So the sun is in uh, or very close to Cancerai, a, um, a constellation of stars that somebody has a great imagination and thinks looks like a crab uh when when he was born and so ivan what what where was the sun when you were born uh i'm a scorpio you're scorpio so scorpio also happens to be in the direction of the center of our galaxy so um so if you look out towards scorpio uh that's and you see that on the sky, you're looking towards the center of our galaxy, the most active part of our galaxy. And for me, um, the sun slowly with time, when the Greeks made this whole system up, it was set. And uh, But slowly with time, the, the sun and the Earth's orbit around the sun shifts a little bit. And so the sun actually isn't in the constellation where I'm supposed to be a Sagittarius, but the sun wasn't actually in Sagittarius when I was born. It was in a constellation called Ophiuchus. So if you ask a Greek person who believes in the old Greek astrology, then I would be a Sagittarius. And if you ask an astronomer where the sun was, then I would say, I would say I'm an Ophiuchus. So, and uh, let's see, was that all of your question? If I didn't answer all of your question, um, you can ask something else. So, oh, and I wanna make sure we I ask um, our host. Um, our host is Shadow the Scientist. And uh, I am the scientist, I suppose. Uh, Evan and Ivan are scientists in training. And um, and we are astronomers, and so you're shadowing an astronomer. But I wanted to take a quick uh, get a question from you. This is part of um, La Noche, and uh, La Noche, the idea is to open you to science and to the possibilities of you becoming a, a scientist or an engineer. So if you had to choose, another type of scientist to shadow, what type of scientist would that be? Would that be biologist or a marine biologist or a geologist or uh, an engineer building cool things? You know, what what is it that you think would be a cool thing to have a shadow the scientist for? So if you put that in the chat, then... Um, I'd be happy to try to work with um, your MESA teachers and maybe try to set up uh, through the UCSC resources, maybe we can set up a different type of shadow the scientist. 
marine biologist. Okay. I think we have some marine biologists on uh, the UCSC campus. So um, you could probably find something cool for them to talk about. Oh, pure math. Gee, I don't know. Pure math. That's pretty frightening. Would be interesting. I'm not sure what they would talk about. I'd have to ask biochemistry. You know, they could probably do some cool experiments live on Zoom, and they wouldn't have to worry about weather. So, um, Matthew, may I add something? Oh, please. So for those of you who are interested in marine biology, we actually will be having um, about a dozen sessions coming up starting uh, late December with the crew of the Joydas Resolution. This is a group of oceanographers out uh, taking um, ocean floor uh, core samples to better understand the Earth's climate and changes. So if that's at all interesting, uh, please check back next week to the Shadow of the Scientist website um, and the registration link for those sessions will be open. Uh, and those sessions will be two in uh, the last two weeks of December and four in January. So please join us. Cool. Great. Okay. Um, in, in addition, uh, I'll also give a plug to the uh, UC Santa Cruz Gen uh, Genomics Institute. Um, we will, those of you interested in chemistry, biochemistry, um, all of that, um, bioengineering, we will have sessions uh, coming up with the University of California Santa Cruz uh, Genomics Institute. We had our first session with them a few weeks ago uh, with a group of students from Berkeley City College. And we will now have open sessions starting in hopefully mid-January or early February. So uh, I'll be sure that Matthew is aware of those in case um, you'd like to connect with him to find out more, but you can always uh, check us out at the Shadow of the Scientist website for those as well. Thank you. Cool. That's great. Um, let's see. I guess I should go back to a couple of the questions. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gustavo has asked, let's see. Uh, oh, uh, I missed one here. Let's see. Uh, what is something you do not like from the experience? Uh, maybe that was a question for Evan. Sure, yeah. Um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, your your body is certainly not built to stay up all night uh, for <laughs> multiple nights on end. It's um, it's like built into our biology to not want to do that. Um, and so, you know, I would go up there for a few nights in a row and I'm working from four in the afternoon until six in the morning and um and then i sleep all day long basically and uh at the end of the week it can it wipes you out in a very strange way uh you know despite getting eight hours of sleep every night you're still exhausted and um but it's not that's not to say i didn't i don't enjoy staying up all night in the telescope it's just one of those things you have to kind of you, you learn as you become an astronomer you know, that, that routine of staying up all night and becoming a vampire. Um, but at the same time, that was one of the things that I liked most about the experience is getting to stay up all night on the telescope. There's something, you know, great about that. That's hard to explain. Um, but yeah. Okay, so Gustavo asked, um, do I personally know anyone who's traveled out into space and um, how were their experiences out there? I have met a few astronauts over my years, um, but only in passing. Um, so I don't really know any of them. So um, I can't really answer answer that question well. Um, I think that would be a super cool thing to, to, to do. And in fact, when I was young, I wanted to be an astronaut. And uh, when I was a young man, there was a height limit and you could not be taller than six foot two. And I am six foot 
two and a half, uh, or at least I was when I was uh, 18 years old. And so at that point, I knew I could not become an astronaut. And so I decided to do the next best thing, which was become an astronomer. Uh, now, now they have taken away a lot of those strict requirements. So uh, an astronaut can be any gender, can be almost any age. Uh, they don't let children generally go up because they're still growing and space plays, does terrible things to your, to your body um, when you're in outer space. And so to do that to somebody who's growing seems like a, a terrible idea. Uh, let's see. So Alexander said, is uh, time dilation something real, like in the movie Interstellar? Um, yes. So it is a real thing, and um, it's actually easily testable. You can take one of our most um, accurate clocks in the world, which is called an atomic clock, and this has been done, and you can put it in an airplane and fly it fast. It doesn't matter where it flies. It can fly around the world or it can fly in big circles above you. It doesn't matter. It just needs to move fast. And then it comes back to where the other atomic clocks are. So you have two that are close together. And then you um, take this one and you move it very fast somewhere right over here in big circles at high speed. And then you bring it back and you check the clocks and the one that moved uh, was moving quickly will have a slower clock. It will be behind the one that was not. And so that's the time dilation, that's relativity. That's what Einstein, um, one of the things that Einstein is famous for. So it's a real thing. I would point out that in the movie Interstellar, they have gravity time dilation. Um, and too. Matthew's yes. talking about, uh, you know, going very fast and time dilating. So you can go very fast and time will dilate, or you can go in a very strong gravity field and uh, you'll also time dilate. Yes, time is one of the things that scientists, physicists know the least about. Um, it's to measure time, you have to know what you, where you are in the universe and how close you are to something else. So it seems like it's a very peculiar property of the universe that depends how fast you're moving, it depends on how close you are to another object with mass. So time is a very complicated thing in physics. All right, let's see, so that's time dilation. Uh, how do you balance your time? Uh, if several challenges came up at the same time, uh, how would you prioritize? So um, it's always a balance. So um, everything that we do, I have students that I have to pay attention to or else they won't be able to graduate with a good uh, result. And I have my own research, and then I have duties that I do for the observatory. And so you do, you try to estimate how much time everything will take. And then you say, yes, Evan and Ivan, you get one hour on these days, and then I'll be available to answer on another couple hours. Uh, but I can't do more than that because I have other things that I have to do. So it's it's a really hard balance to do uh, all of the work and uh, which targets to do is another type of balancing. You know, how do you pick which stars? Well, you make your best guess as to the most interesting star. And uh, if it's too faint, then you're like, oh, well, I can have a choice between one interesting star or a hundred somewhat interesting stars. Um, so, Everything is a, a balance. Maybe I haven't quite got your question right, but I think we're gotten to the end. Um, oh, there's a question about flat earthers. I love flat earthers. They are so much fun. 
So, um, yeah, there are so many ways to measure the curvature of the Earth. You can see it from an airplane. You can ask somebody to draw a map of uh, the world and say, how do you get from the left side to the right side? Um, and, and if it's a round globe, then it makes sense. You can easily get from Korea to Hawaii. But if you have Korea and Hawaii on opposite ends of a flat earth map, then that doesn't make any sense. So um, there are so many ways to talk to a flat earther to make them think about what the world actually looks like. But our time is up and thank you all. And remember that there's another Shadow the Scientist uh, available on for La Noche. That's in January in Spanish. And um, there are all those others that are coming that, uh, that we have available too. Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks everyone. So I think Jamika has left as well. So I think that leaves me for his host. So I will just end for all. And uh, Evan and Ivan, it looks to be a boring night. All and right. So um, I'll stay up. And if it clears, then I'll take some data for Ivan. So. All righty. Back so. to homework. Okay. See you later. Good luck <laughs> with Kwan. Yeah, thank you. A good one.